May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be always acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Wisdom. Well, you'd think by now that we would be wise, right? With everything that has happened to us, with the life experience that we have gained, with all the tears that we have shed, and yes, with all the joys that have filled our souls with laughter, with the experience of trial by fire, trial and error, or simply riding the wave and weathering the storm, one might believe that we are indeed equipped for greatness and would have learned enough to consider ourselves wise. However, it would seem that we are still struggling with the same old questions and coming up with the same old answers. Me, 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 me. Where does wisdom live anyway? Well, Proverbs tells us that wisdom lives in the street. Wisdom cries out in the street, in the squares. She raises her voice at the busiest corner. She cries out at the entrance of the city gates. Wisdom speaks. That tells me that wisdom engages with people where the people are. Wisdom seeks us out where we are living our lives, right here in the street, at the malls, at the plazas, at the theater, at the restaurant, at the grocery store, in our bedrooms, in the kitchen, in the living room, and definitely around the dinner table. Wisdom engages us at the hospital, at our churches, at the mosque, at the synagogue, at political rallies, at public demonstrations, and definitely at a general federal election. Even the folk singers Simon and Garfunkel knew that the words of the prophets are written on the subway walls and the tenement halls. Wisdom causes us to reflect in times of crisis, to reflect at the times of our deepest challenges and also to reflect in the moments of serenity and peace. Wisdom meets us where we are and challenges us to think about who we are. And I believe that leads us on to reflection on who we might want to become and what we might stand for and champion for the sake of justice and human rights and dignity. I think that wisdom takes us out of the focus on the me, 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 and helps us to see that it is all about us, us, us. And there really isn't a them. This reminds me of the cartoon Pogo where he and his friend are walking our particularly difficult pathway. And Pogo says, we have met the enemy and he is us. I am sure that you've also heard the phrase, I am my own worst enemy, right? I love the way the psalmist for today puts it. One day tells its tale to another and one night imparts knowledge to another. Although they have no words or language and their voices are not heard, their sound has gone out into all the lands and their message to the ends of the world. Now that's the spread of wisdom. Wisdom's story is going to be told no matter what. This is also true about ourselves. Our own story is going to be told and known no matter what. So what is our legacy to be? What wisdom will we be known for? What life experiences will reflect the wisdom of our own souls? And is our wisdom connected to our heart? 
Have we made the connection between being wise and caring for others and loving our neighbor as ourselves? I wonder. Of course, Jesus always cuts to the chase and gets right to the heart of the matter, doesn't he? Straight to the point Jesus, you might say. When everyone else is making guesses on who Jesus is, like John the Baptist, reborn, I guess, Elijah, or one of the prophets, Jesus asks his faithful friends, those who are closest to him, who do you say that I am? Peter's wise, insightful, and perhaps naive answer is, you are the Messiah. Bravely said, Peter. But just like we might be ourselves when faced with the opposite definition of what it is to be the Messiah, Peter's wisdom falls flat on his face. Jesus describes to the twelve that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by those in power and, in fact, be killed and after three days rise again. Well, believe me, none of the twelve, including Peter, even heard the three days rise again conclusion. They couldn't get past the definition of a suffering Messiah because, after all, the Messiah that they had in mind was one with the hand of God and perhaps military might would crush the tyranny of the Roman occupation of Israel and Jerusalem. Well, so much for preconceived notions. Peter's exclamation, this will never happen to you, Jesus, totally deflates any wisdom or previous insight that he might have had earlier. Has this experience ever happened to you? After some amazing insight and then within the same breath, a bonehead position is taken or a silly thing might be said that totally dismisses any credibility you might have had previously established for yourself ever happened to you? Okay, you know, it's happened to me. Just ask my mother, or in these days, just ask Yvette. <laughs> Can you imagine? And it's only taken me my whole life to get there. Imagine. Just watch any political debate and you will see it unfold right before your very eyes. You might just call it clay feet or dualism, two-faced, or just simply the inability to hold on to the mountaintop experience. We all have to come down from the mountains sometime, don't we? So we must never think that we have it all together when the truth of the matter is that we are always having precious insight for a brief moment. And then it slips from our fingers and our minds and we are left with our vulnerable state of being that is totally dependent on the amazing grace of God. You know, God is faithful even when we are not. This, my friends, I depend upon. Like Peter, we cannot always focus on divine and heavenly things because our earthly experience is always pulling us, not down, but back to reality. That is also why Peter, or for us for that matter, cannot sustain walking on water. Sooner or later we realize what we are doing and that we are not nearly equipped enough to continue. So, like Peter, we sink. Last week, when some of us gathered to talk about how we were feeling about the pandemic, the isolation, the fear, the uncertainty, and the fragility of our lives, I shared a particular insight that I think is always applicable. And so it is applicable today as well. Out of despair, we find hope. And as the Apostle Paul says, hope will never 
disappoint us. This phrase is an appropriate mantra in light of the 20th anniversary of the 9-11 tragedy, the crumbling of the Twin Towers and all of the destruction and death of that fateful morning in 2001. I guess, really, what I'm trying to say is that it's okay not to have all the answers or even maybe any of the answers. Sometimes it's just good to be in a place we are really just asking questions. Questions are good. And anyway, questions might just lead to wisdom, even if only for a moment. So today as we gather once again for in-person worship, let us remain hopeful even in the midst of our despair and the continued uncertainty of our own world in this pandemic, because surely this too must pass. And now, I hope these words of wisdom don't fall flat on their face. Hmm.